I have the opinion for the court this morning in case number 20-1199, Students for Fair Admissions versus the President and Fellows of Harvard College, and case number 21707, Students for Fair Admissions versus the University of North Carolina. These cases involve the admissions systems used by Harvard College and the University of North Carolina. Both schools acknowledge that they use race as one factor in making their admissions decisions and that race is a decisive factor for some of the students that they admit. The question in these cases is whether Harvard and UNC's programs are permissible under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. We conclude that they are not. In the wake of the Civil War, Congress proposed and the states ratified the 14th Amendment, providing that no state shall, quote, deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. To its proponents, the Equal Protection Clause represented a foundational principle. As Representative John Bingham put it, the absolute equality of all citizens of the United States politically and civilly before their own laws. Or to quote Representative, Representative Thaddeus Stevens, any law which operates upon one man should operate equally upon all. Or, as Senator Jacob Howard of Michigan explained during the amendment's passage in Congress, the Equal Protection Clause would give to the humblest and poorest of the black race the same rights and the same protection before the law as it gives to the most powerful or the most wealthy. Many of this Court's decisions issued shortly after the Equal Protection Clause's adoption understood its broad and transformative sweep. In 1880, for example, we explained the clause promise that, quote, the law in the states shall be the same for the black as for the white, that all persons, whether black or white, shall stand equal before the laws of the states. And in 1886, we explained that the Equal Protection Clause applies without regard to any differences of race, of color, or of nationality. It is universal in its application. Now, as anyone familiar with American history knows, however, for many years thereafter, the Equal Protection Clause failed to live up to its full promise. Jim Crow laws and decisions of this court upholding them meant that state-enforced discrimination continued in many parts of America for decades. It was a sad and egregious chapter in our nation's history. It was not until 1954, more than 80 years after the adoption of the Equal Protection Clause, that things began to fundamentally change. That year, we issued one of the most important decisions that this court has ever reached, Brown versus Board of Education. The case concerned segregation in local schools. The school board in the case had argued that such segregation was permissible because, while black students and white students were separated, the quality of the educational facilities each received were allegedly equal. We unanimously rejected that argument. Separate but equal, we explained, was inherently unequal. As the court put it, the right to a public education must be made available to all on equal terms. And that was so, as the plaintiffs in the case had argued, because no state has any authority under the Equal Protection Clause to use race as a factor in affording educational opportunities among its citizens. In the years that followed our seminal decision in Brown, this court repeatedly struck down state laws that treated people differently because of the color of their skin. But both Harvard and UNC acknowledge that, for some students they admit, race is a determinative factor. For those students, who are no doubt talented and accomplished, race is what makes the difference, just as it makes the difference for whichever applicant was rejected in their place. This court first considered whether universities could use race as a factor in admissions in 1978 in a case called Regents of the University of California versus Bakke. The case produced six different opinions, none of which commanded a majority of the court. But one opinion, written by Justice Powell for himself alone, would come to serve as the touchstone for race-based admissions policies going forward. Justice Powell explained that such policies could not be sustained on the ground that they remedy general discrimination against minority groups. Nor could such a program be upheld based on the need to fix the deficit of minority students on university campuses. Instead, he explained, universities could only consider race to ensure that students received what he called the educational benefits of diversity. In 2003, 25 years after Bakke, we considered the issue again in the case Grutter versus Bollinger. 
There, in a splinter decision, a majority of the court for the first time held that universities could make race-based admissions decisions to pursue the educational benefits of diversity. While doing so, however, the court and Grutter expressed serious concerns about the use of race in college admissions. We explained that there are serious problems of justice connected with the idea of racial preference itself. And we observed that all racial classifications, however compelling their goals, were dangerous. That was so, Grutter explained, because racial preferences offend the fundamental equal protection principle at the heart of the 14th Amendment. For that reason, Grutter imposed one critical limit on race-based admissions programs. At some point, the court held, they must end. The court made this important point six different times in six different ways. All race-conscious admissions programs must have a termination point, it explained. They must have reasonable durational limits. They must be limited in time. They must have sunset provisions. They must have a logical endpoint and their deviation from the norm of equal treatment must be a temporary matter. The importance of an endpoint was not just a matter of repetition. It was the reason the court was willing to let universities continue to act contrary to the Constitution's unambiguous guarantee of equal protection, to maintain, despite our landmark decision in Brown, an education system where race mattered. It has now been 20 years since Grutter, and no end to race-based admissions programs is in sight. Instead, the universities here candidly ask us to continue to permit them to make race-based admissions decisions indefinitely. They argue that they are pursuing the educational benefits of diversity and that their admissions programs can end only when those benefits are realized. Harvard, for example, identifies the following educational benefits that it is pursuing training future leaders in the public and private sectors, preparing graduates to adapt to an increasingly pluralistic society, better educating its students through diversity, and producing new knowledge stemming from diverse outlooks. UNC points to similar goals. Now, of course, those are commendable goals, but there is no way for courts to know when they have been reached. How is a court supposed to measure those goals? to evaluate whether leaders have been adequately trained, whether the exchange of ideas is robust, or whether new knowledge is being developed. And even if these goals could be measured, there is no way for courts to determine when universities must or must not use racial preferences to achieve them. So despite the Equal Protection Clause, and despite this country's now nearly 70-year effort to remove race from governmental decision-making, the universities here all but say trust us when it comes to making race-based decisions. They point to a tradition of giving a degree of deference to a university's academic decisions, which they argue means we should not interfere. We disagree. Universities may, de may define their missions as they see fit. The Constitution defines ours. Under the Equal Protection Clause, courts may not allow the separation of students on the basis of race without an exceedingly persuasive justification that is measurable and concrete enough to permit meaningful judicial review. As this court has repeatedly reaffirmed, racial classifications are simply too permissious to per permit any but the most exact connection between justification and classification. Here, for the reasons we have explained, that connection is missing. Having failed to articulate clear and measurable goals, the universities next argue that they should be allowed to make race-based decisions to remedy the underrepresentation of minority groups on their campuses. But none of our cases have ever permitted universities to consider race for that purpose. To the contrary, we have explained that outright racial balancing is patently unconstitutional. Here, by promising to terminate their use of race only when some rough percentage of various racial groups is admitted, the universities turn that principle on its head. Their admissions programs effectively assure that race will always be relevant and that the ultimate goal of eliminating race as a criterion will never be achieved. Finally, we cannot agree that the universities may consider race to remedy the effects of societal discrimination. That rationale has been foreclosed by our precedents for decades. Were it otherwise, as Justice O'Connor put it in another case, the dream of a nation of equal citizens would be lost in a mosaic of shifting preferences based on inherently unmeasurable claims 
of past wrongs. Such a result, she continued, would be contrary to both the letter and spirit of a constitutional provision whose central command is equality. We do not suggest today that universities must ignore an applicant's discussion of how race affected his or her life, be it through discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise. But universities may not simply establish through application essays or other means the regime we hold unlawful today. As we have said, what cannot be done directly cannot be done indirectly. The Constitution deals with substance, not shadows. For too long, many universities have wrongly concluded that the touchstone of an individual's identity is not challenges bested, skills built, or lessons learned, but the color of their skin. Our constitutional history does not tolerate that choice. Nearly 130 years ago, this court issued the decision in Plessy versus Ferguson, where we upheld a Jim Crow law that required racial segregation on trains. Plessy has correctly gone down as one of the most reviled decisions that this court has ever issued. But at the time it was decided, Plessy was almost unanimous. The vote on the court was seven to one. The one was Justice John Marshall Harlan. He courageously dissented writing then only for himself and for history. Quote, in the view of the Constitution, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. Today we reaffirm that guiding principle. The judgments of the Court of Appeals for the First Circuit and of the District Court for the Middle District of North Carolina are reversed. Justice Thomas has filed a concurring opinion. Justice Gorsuch has filed a concurring opinion in which Justice Thomas joins. Justice Kavanaugh has filed a concurring opinion. Justice Sotomayor has filed a dissenting opinion in which Justice Kagan and Justice Jackson join. Justice Jackson has filed a dissenting opinion in which Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan joined. Justice Jackson did not participate in the Harvard case. 